Hi, everybody. I want to encourage you to go check out our website. We have amazing booklets available, Mastering Your Emotions, Understanding Rational Emotions, and Emotional Intelligence. And we're very excited. Today, we've released a new booklet. And this booklet will teach you why do I sometimes pray and why do I sometimes trust for something, but it doesn't feel like anything is happening. What must I do to get my breakthrough? This booklet is called The Seed and the Soil. So I hope you guys check out our website. I know it's going to bless you and enjoy today's message. The law said you have to go do this, but the law never gave you the power and the ability to go do that. Here Christ comes and he says, through knowing me, I'm going to give you a power and an ability. Welcome to Theano's Life Training, and we are starting a new series. I hope this series doesn't take too long, but if it takes about six weeks to eight weeks or eight lessons, please stick with us. Um, but I'm very happy to share this message with you tonight. We're going to speak about understanding law and grace. What is law? What is grace? How does it work in the Bible? I think this is a question that many people have, or I hope so. And um, well, I get asked the question a lot. So um, I, I've decided to do a teaching on it. And as I started to prepare, I've realized it's going to be a lengthy teaching, but I think it's important for you guys to know this. So we're starting this series on understanding law and grace. Before we start, a few things you guys can do to help us um, grow, expand this ministry. Number one, please share, please like, please subscribe to this channel. And please get us on Facebook and on Instagram and share our messages. Also, I want to give a big thanks to all of those who are contributing financially. You know, financial contribution and giving is a biblical thing. So I'm going to speak about this quickly, not about giving the whole time, but I want to mention what the Bible says about giving. John 6 verse 9 to 12, the Bible says in verse 9, here is a boy with five small, small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? So what they had was five loaves, loaves, two fish. And if you understand biblical history, they had about 15 to 20,000 people to feed. Verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Now, you just heard me say 15,000 to 20,000 people. So it was 5,000 men with their families in the context. So if, you, if, if each of them had one wife and one child, they would have been 15,000 people. Maybe they had more children. So um, Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. When they had all enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, and nothing was wasted. So here they take five loaves, two fish, and it multiplied to leftover. How did it multiply? As they gave. So what's the moral of the story? What's the moral of the scripture? The Bible is clear. As you give, God will multiply you. So if that's you, if you are praying about this and God is telling you to give to this ministry, what I encourage you to give, our banking details will be on the screen. Um, the net bank banking details for everybody in South Africa that wants to give and then our SWIFT code and our email address for our PayPal for all the international givers. And, the, and in the description, you will also find our details. I want to thank you guys for giving. Thank you guys for taking this ministry and this company forward. We really appreciate you guys. So let's start with the message on understanding law and grace. This is something that I'm very passionate about. You guys know I'm a grace preacher. You guys know I, I, I understand, or let me rather say, teach the grace of God. I don't think I understand it as great as it is yet, but it's something that I am studying and I am going to try to articulate and explain to you the importance of the grace of God. And I'm going to try to explain to you why the law could not do what grace does. And, you know, many people say, you know, you cannot teach grace. You cannot speak about grace because as soon as you speak about grace, people are going to start sinning. People are going to start getting uncommitted. And I, and I just want to say, if you ever say that, you do not understand grace. If you, if you think that your understanding of grace is so, so, so wrong. 
Now, the Bible says, if you read the book of Corinthians, the Bible says the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. If you look at what religion really is, the scripture teaches us religion is a form of godliness, but denying its power. And I believe in this message that God is going to give some people power, but God cannot give people power through the law. The Bible says that God gives us power by grace. Grace is the thing that should be multiplied. How can I say that God will give us power by grace? But we're going to get to this later. The, the, the word grace, charis, unmerited favor, empowerment. So grace is not a cover for sin. Grace is an empowerment. And if there's one thing we need more and more, it is the grace of God. You know, I once asked one of my friends, and this was long ago, and I can still remember it. This just shows how um, this, this bothers me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But I do want to use it as an example. I asked one of my friends one time if he wants to go to the movies with me. Now, I just want to say this. I do like weird movies. I'm not going to say anything, anything further. Um, it's not bad. It's not ungodly. Don't worry. It's just weird. So I like weird movies. And he said to me, no, I don't feel like going to a movie with you. And I was kind of like... Um, no, what is wrong with my friend? My, my, my first reaction was, what is wrong with me? Why doesn't, don't my, doesn't my friend want to go to a movie with me? Um, so later I said, like, dude, did I, did, did, did I do something wrong? Are you angry with me or what? He's like, no, why? I said, because you don't want to go to a movie with me. He's like, no, I just don't feel like going to a movie. Like, we can do something. Let's go eat something. Let's go, you know, whatever. Let's go. Yeah, I think we said eat something. That's what we do if we don't watch a movie. Uh, bear with us. But um, <laughs> one thing about me is one thing I hate is if somebody does something with me and they don't really want to. Have you ever experienced that? Like somebody is with you and you can, and you can feel in the atmosphere, this person doesn't want to be there. The, or this person don't want to be there. These people don't want to be there, but they are there and, you know, we are, we are doing this. And I'm afraid that that's how Christianity has become for many people. You know, I will do my prayers. I will do my Bible study. I will go to church. I will, I will do some godly things. It's not really something I want to do, but as a Christian, maybe that's the right thing to do. That is law. You know, when you, I had this one, lady friend once if i can say it like that and we were we were interested in each other and i realized this girl came to the movies with me every single time i wanted to watch a movie and i can promise you it's not because she was interested in the movies <laughs> that i wanted to watch she was interested in me now don't try to figure out who it is this was long years and years and years ago but uh she she actually got excited to do something with me because of me. I got excited to, to do things with her because of her. Like things that I didn't normally would do, I started to do. Things that she didn't normally would do, she started to do. Why? Because you're so excited to be with this person and nothing is I have to. Everything is now I want to. You will never see two people falling in love, if we can say it like that. You will never see two people falling in love and somebody has to explain, sit them down and say, okay, great. Now that you are in love, remember, number one, you have to spend time with this person. Number two, you have to give this person gifts, right? You, you never do things like that and you have to explain to people, listen, you must now learn to have fun with this person. No, those things come, come naturally, right? As soon as you fall in love with somebody, it is a want to. I have a desire to spend time with you. I am excited to hear from you. The Bible says, I was glad when they told me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Now, when we say we live under grace and not, uh, and not under law, we're not saying at all that, you know, now I'm under grace. I don't have to go to church. I'm under grace. I don't have to give financially. I'm under grace. I don't have to obey. I'm under grace. That's not what grace does. Law says, do these things. You don't want to, but do them. Grace says, I fell in love. Now I want to do the things that makes the other person happy. When you, when you are under grace, you know, there is such a power within you. 
People get saved by the grace of God. People get delivered by the grace of God. People get healed by the grace of God. I can do this teaching by the grace of God. By the grace of God, we can go so much further. Before I was a Christian, I was a stingy person, unless when I was drunk. But when I was sober, I was a stingy person. When I got born again, when the grace of God touched me, I became a generous person. Before I got, before I got saved, although I knew the law, I enjoyed sin. When I got saved, I enjoyed the things of God. Now, when I make a mistake, when I sin, when I mess up, grace is there to cover my sin, yes. Grace is there to forgive my sin, yes. And mercy is there to say, I don't, I'm not going to receive the punishment. But that doesn't give me the desire to go sin. That gives me the desire to live for Christ all the more. That is what grace does. So by this teaching, we're not saying the law is bad. We're just saying the law cannot do these things for you. So let's go to Scripture 1 John, no, John 1, sorry, don't go to John 1, there is, go to John 1, don't go to 1 John, go to John 1. John 1 verse 16, the Bible says, and I'm reading from the Passion Translation now, and from the overflow of His fullness, He uses overflow and He uses fullness, we receive grace heaped upon more grace. If you want overflow, if you want fullness, the answer is grace heaped upon more grace. This is what God is giving us. Verse 17, Moses gave the law. Now listen, the Bible doesn't say overflow, fullness, and then law. The Bible says overflow, fullness, and then grace. And then he says Moses gave us the law, but Jesus the anointed one. Listen, here you will see again, anointing. The anointing is the power of God to do. I can speak by the anointing. When you lay hands on people and they get healed, it's by the anointing. When people get delivered, it's by the anointing. When somebody can give a great, powerful sermon where the power of God touches people, that's by the anointing. You can have good information. You can have a good message without having the anointing. But it's the anointing, the Bible says, that breaks change, breaks, breaks burdens. It's the anointing. Now, here again, the, in, the anointing is on the side of Jesus, not on the side of the law. The anointing, the, the Bible doesn't say the anointing comes through Moses and his law. The Bible says the anointing comes through Jesus Christ. Unveiled truth wrapped in tender mercy. So grace and mercy doesn't produce ungodliness. It's grace and mercy that produces anointing. It's grace and mercy that produces overflow. Verse 18, no one ever before gazed upon the full splendor of God except his uniquely beloved son, who is cherished by the father and held close to his heart. Now that he has come to us, he has unfolded the full explanation of who God truly is. Jesus came, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to show you now out of scripture, that grace is not a teaching. Grace is not a biblical doctrine. Grace is not one of the messages. Grace is a person. So let's look at what the Bible says in John 1, verse 16 to 18. Now I'm going to read from the New King James Version. It says, And of His fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. Remember what the Passion Translation said, grace heaped upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given impersonal. Grace and truth came personal. So in this context, if we read here, we see grace is a person. Grace is not something. Grace is not a teaching. It's a person. Verse 18, no one has, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has declared Him. So here the Bible is very clear that it's the grace of God that produces overflow. It's the grace of God that, that produces fullness. It's the grace of God that produces the anointing. And if I can say it in this context, because it, because it fits in together, it's the grace of God that produces the power of God to flow. Therefore, we want to grow in grace. The Bible says, Scripture teaches us that we grow through grace in humility. What is true humility? True humility is not, you know, I think less of myself, I'm not important. True humility is like David was when he slayed Goliath, when he, when he said, with God in me, 
I can kill this giant. And how can I connect that to grace? Because uh, David picked up five stones. He only needed one, but he picked up five. Why did he pick up five? Because five is the number of grace. Grace is the power that's going to help you to knock every single giant down that's in your way. How do you get more grace? By humility. Humility is saying, I'm getting myself out of the way. I'm getting my will out of the way. I'm getting my laws, my tradition, my religion, my way of doing things. I'm getting that out of the way so that the power of God can take over. That's how you increase in the grace of God. So let's see what is the goal. And, I'm, and, and according you know, to this teaching I'm giving, what is the goal? What do we want to reach or what do we want to become, if I can say that? What is the goal? as Christians. Obviously, the most important thing is, is to get saved. And that is also by grace. The Bible says you get saved by grace through faith. But now that we are saved, what is the important thing? The number one, the most important thing right now is to know him. You can know the law and not know the person. The most important thing to do right now is to know him. And the only way we can know him is through grace. Listen to what the Bible says in Philippians 3, verse 8 to 10. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. May gain Christ, may know Christ. So he's saying everything else for this moment is rubbish so that I can know Christ. Verse 9, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is from faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Verse 10, that I may know him, listen, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. Knowing the power. So what he's saying, if I want to walk in power, I, wanna, I want to know him. I want to know him, something that the law couldn't do. The law could give you direction, I guess. The law can give, could give you instruction, but the law could never cause you to know him. And therefore, the law could never cause somebody to walk in power. The law said you may not do this, but the law never gave you the power and the ability not to do that. The law said you have to go do this, but the law never gave you the power and the ability to go do that. Here Christ comes and he says, through knowing me, I'm going to give you a power and an ability. I believe and I want to say this, people who are watching the message right now, I speak this over you, that by understanding the grace of God, you're going to walk in a power, you're going to walk in an influence, you're going to walk in a grace that you could never walk in before. You're going to know Him in a way that you've never known Him before because you understand the grace of God. Or I want, in, I want grace to increase in my life. John 17 verse 3, the Bible says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So here, here we see very clearly the first goal is to know this person. Let me take it back to relationship again. I can say, somebody can tell me, do these 10 things, and I'm using it as, a, as, a, as an example for the Ten Commandments. Somebody can say, do these 10 things because there's a girl out there that's beautiful and she will be very happy if you do these 10 things. And I can do those 10 things for years without ever meeting the girl, without ever experiencing the girl without ever having a relationship with the icon. And that's what, that's what law does. The law says do these 10 things or do these, you know, 600 plus things if we really want to go into the law. But you can, you can have the law. You can know the law front to back. The Pharisees knew the law front to back. They could quote um, the scriptures at that time front to back, but they never knew you know what Jesus said to them? He said to them, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Now listen again to what the Bible says in John 1, 
verse 17, remember I said to you, grace was a person. For the law was given through Moses, impersonal, but grace and truth came. So grace and truth was a person. So when Jesus said to the Pharisees, you shall know the truth, they thought, but we know the truth. We know the law front to back. He said to them, you're not free because you don't know the truth. Why? Because the truth was a person. To know him, to know him is the first important thing. Something we cannot do, we could not do through the law. Yes, the law pointed us, the law showed us that we need this person. But the law was never the answer. So the first thing we have to do, the most important thing is to know him. The second thing, to be who he has called us to be or to be who he has called me to be. I cannot understand my calling without the grace of God. I cannot understand my calling without the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 John 3 verse 1 to 2, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it didn't know him. So what the Bible is saying here is if people in the world don't understand you, if people in the world or in religion don't understand why you act the way you act, why you do the way you do, it's because they don't know him. Verse 2, beloved, now we are children of God and it is not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him. So you see how much John in this context is speaking about being. He's not speaking about doing, he's speaking about being, because we have to be who he has called us to be. After we understand and know him, what's going to happen is he's going to introduce us to us, or he's going to introduce us to the person he has called us to be. If, we, if you go look at the book of Matthew, if you look at this conversation that Peter had with Jesus, uh, Jesus said to Peter, who do you say that I am? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus said, and I tell you, you are Peter. Based on your revelation, when you know who I am, I'm going to tell you who you are. I'm going to introduce you to the person that I created you to be. As, as you walk with Christ, as you pray, as you spend time with God, you know what he's going to do? He's going to introduce you to the person that he has created you to be. And the law cannot introduce you to that person. Only Christ can. And what is he saying? To be like him. You can, get, you can preach great messages. You can, know, you can know the written law front to back and still not be the person who Christ has created you to be. So before my doing, before what I do, before what I achieve, the most important thing is who am I in Christ? By the grace of God, I can understand who am I in Christ. If you go read Galatians 5.22, one of my favorite scriptures and one of the scriptures that I speak so much about, the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit. Now listen, fruit, there's a difference between, between fruit and, 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 and something you produce. Because fruit comes by a seed that is plant, planted and the fruit grows naturally because of the seed, right? I cannot produce fruit from my works. So the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit or what comes naturally because of the seed that is planted is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And the Bible says, and against such there is no law. So he says the harder you try to do this from, 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 from the side of the law, the less you're going to do it. But he says if you live under grace, these things, now this, is to, this has to do with who you are. Before you can, before you, you should be focused on preaching great messages. You should be focused on who you are. A person full of love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. The Bible says, and the law cannot give you these things. You cannot produce. I cannot take a tree and then cause it to produce for the right seed has to be planted. And if the right seed, if the seed of Christ 
is planted on the inside of you, these things should become natural. So I don't, I don't sit every day and say, I have to love people. I have to forgive people. I have to be nice to people. I have to be kind to people. I have to be. No, it's something that comes naturally because of the grace of God. Do I sometimes fail? Yes. Do I sometimes get angry? Yes. Do I sometimes treat people wrong? Yes. But then the grace of God comes and say, I forgive you. I don't hold this against you. That's mercy. And I empower you to go on again because this now sin, making a mistake, missing the mark. Now it's not something. Now it is not who I am. It's something I did. I'm not a sinner anymore. Because of the grace of God, I'm now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And what comes out of me is to serve God and the fruit of the Spirit. And when I make a mistake, it's a mistake I made. It's not who I am. And that is why it's important to understand, as you know Christ, He's going to introduce you to the person that you are called to be. Only the grace of God can cause you. This is why if we have grace in people, we bring the best out of them. If people make a mistake and we forgive them and we treat them with goodness, if we treat them with kindness, like Jesus, that we are bringing the best out of them. So let's go on. The Bible says in John 15 verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit shall remain. Remember, we just spoke about what the fruit is, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. How many people are so focused on what they need to become? I need to be, I need to work harder. I need to be more disciplined. I have to wake up earlier. I have to try harder. I have this mistake and I have to work harder. That's what the Lord does. And it doesn't work. What works is to say, Lord, in my, in myself, there's no answer. I'm going to rest under your grace and the grace of God breaks addiction. The grace of God breaks your anger problems. And, and why do I say that? Because now you don't live in fear anymore. Punishment brings fear. If I'm afraid, if I say, you know, the law says I shall not do this. And if I do this, I'm going to be punished and God is going to be angry. That brings fear and that will cause you to sin more. The Bible says the strength of sin is the law. And we will speak about that in one of the other sessions. So we are not here to tell people do not, do not, do not, do not, don't, don't, don't. We are here to show people the grace and the mercy of God. And as we do that, the Bible says naturally, the grace of God will give them the power to do what is right. You know, I have heard so many people teach, and I'm not saying they are wrong. I just take it, I'm just taking this from a different angle. So many people say, you know, if you obey God, if you do the right thing, God will bless you. But now I look at stories in the Bible where Jesus reached out to some of the worst sinners and he healed their sickness. He healed their blindness. He provided for them. And after they experienced the goodness of God, they got saved. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that brings people to repentance. After the Lord showed him his goodness, they repented. What's, what, what, what we think is I have to repent. I have to do good. I have to do the right thing. And then the Lord will bless me. And I'm, I want to encourage you to repent. If you need to repent, repent means change your mind, change your mind. Brilliant thing. I do a lot of cheat teachings on the importance of your mind. Do that. Obey God. The reason we obey God is because God knows what's best for us. If we obey God, he will take us to great places. I, I'm for obedience. But so many times in the Bible, the goodness of God reached out to the most messed up people and they changed because of his grace. Look at, look at John 8. When people wanted to stone that woman who was caught in the act of adultery, the Lord had grace and mercy on her and that changed her. If we look at Peter, Peter couldn't catch any fish. Jesus came and he said, cast your net again. The Bible says he got a net breaking, boat sinking, loads of fishes. And after that, the Bible says he fell on his knees and he repented after he experienced the goodness of God. How many of you can testify, I can, that sometimes God blessed us and I'm like, God, why? You know, I, I, I actually acted bad in this situation and you blessed me. I made a mistake yesterday and you blessed me. Lord, this doesn't make sense. And that gives you the power to say, listen, oh, I want to live for this God. Can we get to that place where we say, listen, I'm going to start being good to people. I'm going to start showing people grace. 
I'm going to stop telling people what they shouldn't do, what they shouldn't do. Does it work? I want to, I want to ask you, have you ever sat with somebody and you keep on telling them what they are doing wrong and it actually worked? Yes, they might, they might come to you out of guilt. They might go to church out of guilt. But it doesn't work for long. Eventually they fall away. But when people experience the grace of God, oh my word, they become the person that God wants them to become. And the third thing, to do what he has called me to do. And sometimes we're so quick to say, now I have to find my calling. Now I have to find my purpose. Now I have to find all these things. And it's great. It's number three on the list. It's very important. But first, you have to know him. First, I want to know you. I want to know you in person. Second, I want to become the person who you want me to be. I don't want to be a, just an anointed preacher on camera or an anointed preacher with crowds. But I'm not married, but I'm just using it as an, ex as an example. But I actually want to be a good Christian husband and good to my kids and good to my friends. Uh, Dr. Darius Daniels once said, he said, if you really serve Christ, those who know you the best will, will respect you the most. Who am I? But number three, to do what he has called you to do. Out of knowing him comes your being. Out of your being comes your doing. The Bible says in Philippians 3 verse 12 to 14, now that I have, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, so never think you have arrived, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Verse 14, I press towards the goal for the price of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Now I'm pressing to my calling. Now I want to do what God has called me to do. And yes, you know, when you understand what God calls you to do, your calling doesn't become work. Your calling becomes a passion. I'm passionate to speak. I'm passionate to write. I'm passionate to preach. I'm passionate to teach. Whatever you are called to do, I'm passionate to be a lawyer because there are so many people who are falsely accused and I want to help them. I'm passionate to be a doctor and because there are so many people who are sick and I want to help them. I'm passionate to be a teacher because there are so many people who need education and I want to educate them. It's not what the Lord does. is like I have to wake up early in the morning and I have to do this. That's not God's plan for you. God's plan for you is to be passionate about your calling, passionate about, about what you should do. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, who has saved us and has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So he says the thing that's going to fuel your calling, the thing that's going to fuel your purpose is not works. It's not law. It's his grace. I want more of his grace. So I'm coming to an end by explaining this. What does grace do? And, you know, as I'm, as I'm teaching this last part, I really want you to connect to the Spirit of God where you are right now because good words are not going to help you. The power of God needs to touch people right now where they are because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 9 to 10, this is Paul. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, not I, but the grace of God in me. Listen to what he says. He says, the grace of God in me. And this is the Greek word. Remember, I said, I'm gonna give you the Greek for grace. The Greek for grace, it sounds so cool. It's the word charis, which means, that which produces joy, pleasure, and the light. This word is sweetness, loveliness, and charm. <laughs> I love grace. In most, of it, in most of its uses outside the New Testament, in the New Testament, it, it contains the idea of kindness, which you give to someone that does not deserve it. The, 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 this word charis can also refer to the power of God, the unmerited favor of God. And the Bible says through this word grace, through this word grace, Paul said, I labored more than them all. Listen to what the word labor is. Labor is the word kupaiwa, kupaiwa, 
which means to work with the kind of effort that makes you tired. But here this guy didn't get tired. He worked with the kind of effort that gets you tired, but it doesn't seem like you really got tired. Now I'm not saying you, you shouldn't get tired. I'm not saying you shouldn't sleep, that's a mistake. I'm just saying, let me read the, 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 the meaning first. This word can only be used to describe working in the point of having nothing left to give. It is not just work, but work, work that phys physically drains you and makes nece the rest necessary to do it again. This is the word labor that he's using. And you know, God wants us to rest in him so that he can labor through us. Meaning we cannot do this labor. This labor can only happen if we rest in his grace and he's working through us. <laughs> this kind of labor drains a human. This kind of labor makes a human tired. But if a human comes to that place and say, listen, I'm a human. And as a human, I cannot do this. I need the grace of God. I need to rest in his grace. Then I start to produce things that know. Listen to what he said. I'm the least of the apostles. If you look at things like education, ability, skill, gifts, likability, ability. If you look at all these things, I'm worse than all of them. But I said, but I, but I, but I labored more, more abundantly. When they got tired, I could keep going. I had more fruit. I had more results. I had more. And then he says, but yet not I, but this grace of God. <laughs> that's working in me. People, the law cannot do this. Because what the law could not do, listen to what Romans 8 verse 3 says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his son in likeness of, of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. So what the law tried to do, the law maybe tried to get us now in the next session I'm going to explain where the law actually came from and why the law actually was given. What the law tried to do, it couldn't because it was weak. Remember what I said in the beginning, the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. The law was good but it didn't have power. If we understand grace, we're going to walk in power. Power. I want, I want the children of God to walk in power. I want sick people to be healed by coming close to the children of God. I want depressed people to be healed by coming close to the children of God. I want, I want sinners to repent because they come close to the children of God. The problem is at the moment they are running away. Can it be because we don't have the grace that God wants us to have? Or that we're walking in the grace, or that we're not walking in the grace that God wants us to walk in? Oh, my grace be multiplied to you. And I'm going to finish with this. Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 10, the Bible says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Not you. Not your law keeping. This is why you will see people will come and they say, this is so unfair. I did everything right. That's what the Pharisees did. I, get, I did everything right and I'm still sick. Pharisees did it. The Bible says God couldn't heal them because they, rel they relied on the law. Listen, some of the best law keepers in the Bible went to Jesus. The Bible says Jesus couldn't heal them. And then some of the worst sinners came in and they got healed. Why? Because these people said, we kept the law, we did everything right, God must heal, us, must heal us. Then a sinner comes in and say, listen, I've messed up my whole life. If you're going to heal me, if you're going to help me, it's only by your grace. And he touched the one who relied on the grace, not the one who relied on the law. Now, grace didn't keep them in sin. Grace didn't keep them there. Oh no, grace lifted them up. Grace caused them to want to walk with Jesus more. Grace caused them to be the person that God called them to be. Grace caused them to do what God has called them to do. So listen, he says, you are saved by grace through faith, not of works, 
so that you cannot boast. Works is the word ergon, which means anything that is produced by hand or mind. It is literally anything including thoughts, actions, deeds, efforts and production. Whether it's bad or good, it's still a thing and it's still included in the word. So anything that you do by effort is works. So he's saying we're not saved by anything we do by efforts. But now listen to this. In verse 10, the Bible says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we looked at that word works, and it's the same word, Aragon. We are not, the Bible says, you are not saved by works, that which you produced through effort. You are saved by grace for good works. The law says do good works and out of good works, God will save you, God will help you, God will bless you. The scripture here says rest in His grace. And as you rest in His grace, what will come out after that, what will come out as a fruit is your good works. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared forehand that we should walk in them. What the law could not do now, grace does. Where the law was weak, grace now is an empowerment and it's strong. The grace of God, and I want you to watch, who, who are watching me today, for those of you who have been so condemned, who have been, people have made you feel so bad because you're not good enough. Listen, the grace of God is going to touch you. And I'm going to pray for this right now. The grace of God is going to touch you. You're going to feel forgiven. You're going to feel whole. And I want to tell you, don't worry a thing about any person that has something bad to say about you. They might think they are keeping the law so well, but if we follow them around with a camera, it's, it's, it's a different thing. But before I pray for that, I want to pray for this. If there's anybody that says, listen, I have to give my life back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Either I've been living in sin and I'm tired of this, or I've been living under the law and it's not working. I need something that works. I need the grace of God. If that's you, I want you to lift up your hand or just put your hand on your heart because I'm going to pray for you. There's only one way you can be saved and it's through Jesus Christ. If that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, today, I acknowledge I cannot save myself. No law can save me. My good works cannot save me. Only you can. Save me today in Jesus' name. And I want to pray for people right now who feels like they need a touch from the grace of God. The power of God, the anointing of God is going through your camera, through your video, through your screen right now. And I'm going to pray that God will touch some people some people who feel condemned, some people who feel judged, some people who feel that they are not good enough. This caused you to become anxious. This caused you to become paralyzed. I see what, what, what I feel like the Lord is showing me now. There's a lot of people who feel paralyzed. I want to do something for God, but it literally feels like my spirit is paralyzed. Maybe you feel you're not good enough. Maybe society has told you you're not good enough. Maybe people have told you you're the wrong gender, you're the wrong age, you're the wrong color, whatever it might be. Anything that the law has put on you, anything that people has put on you that, caused, that causes you now to feel paralyzed, you feel like you're not walking in the power of God. Wherever you are, I want you to lift your hands and I'm going to break that thing right now in Jesus' wonderful name. God is going to touch you through this camera. The power of God is going to touch you through your screen right now. Father God, I pray for every single person who's feeling condemned, who's feeling judged, who feels bad, who feels like they cannot walk in the power of God, who feels like they cannot do what they are called to do. I thank you, Father God, that I pray right now, Father God, that the grace of God will fall upon them, that the mercy of God will be experienced by them. What's the difference between grace and mercy? Grace gives you good things that you don't deserve. Grace gives you favor you don't deserve. Grace gives you power you don't deserve. Mercy doesn't give you what you do deserve. You deserve punishment. You deserve condemnation. Mercy says, I'm not going to give you those things. Father, I pray that people will experience the grace and the mercy of God right now in Jesus' wonderful name. I thank you that the grace of God will fall upon every addiction and break it. I thank you that the grace of God will fall on any form 
of oppression, depression, anxiety and break it. In Jesus' wonderful name, Father God, any form of stress, break it by the grace of God. Poverty, break it by the grace of God. If you feel like you're trusting God right now for financial increase, I'm going to break every single spirit by the grace of God. And I speak this, I break every single spirit by the grace of God that's keeping you in poverty, that's keeping you in lack. And I pray that rivers of overflow is going to come your way because now you're trusting in the grace of God. Now you're trusting in the person of Jesus Christ, not your effort. Some people are looking back and they say, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Listen, the enemy is attacking you not because of what you are doing wrong, but because he knows the great things that God wants to do through you. But God can only do those great things through you by his grace. Father God, I thank you in this prayer that people will experience the grace of God like never before in Jesus' wonderful name. There are people that are listening to me. You're struggling with unforgiveness whether it's against yourself. And I just feel this in my spirit right now. A lot of people are in unforgiveness towards themselves. Father God, I thank you that the spirit of forgiveness will touch people that they will forgive themselves. And I thank you, Father God, that any person who needs to forgive any person out there, that they will receive your forgiveness. Listen, you cannot forgive other people if you don't receive Christ's forgiveness for yourself. He has forgiven your past sins, He has forgiven your present sins, and He's forgiven your future sins. You are already forgiven. Don't let anybody tell you you still need to do something. The only thing you need to do to experience His forgiveness is accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And that gives you the power to forgive. And I'm going to do a teaching on forgiveness as well. Don't miss it in this series. But I thank you, Father God, that forgiveness will fall on people right now. They will forgive people that they haven't forgiven in years because of your grace. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you guys so much for watching. We are so excited about this series on understanding law and grace. There are still many videos to come. Um, may God bless you. And if this message meant anything to you, I want to encourage you to share it. And let's get this word out in Jesus' name. God bless you and see you guys soon again. Goodbye.